this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. Whether you're looking to sell your business in the near future or just want to make it more scalable and profitable, Work Better Now's virtual assistants can help you get there. Adding a virtual assistant to your team can help you focus on high value activities like business development and training. Work Better Now clients also use their assistants as project managers, marketing and operations coordinators, and customer service representatives. Work Better Now clients say that their virtual executive assistants have made an impact on their business well beyond their expectations. For only $1,900 a month, you get a full-time assistant who is 100% dedicated to your business. There are no contracts, no additional cost. Based in Latin America with incredible English proficiency and business experience, Work Better Now assistants undergo a rigorous screening and onboarding process. Work Better Now is currently offering Built to Sell listeners and readers $150 off per month for three months just by mentioning Built to Sell. To learn more, visit workbetternow.com. You and I both know that running a company is not a bed of roses, right? I mean, I think you've likely reached the point at some point in your entrepreneurial journey where you thought, why on earth am I doing this? This is crazy. This is nuts. My next guest, Melissa Kwan, reached that point in her journey She had built an app, which she'll describe to you, to help real estate agents manage the traffic they got from open houses. It was called Spacio. And despite it being a good idea, it was a slog, a tough slog. And there was an interesting point in this interview where I asked Melissa, why did you keep going? Like, wasn't there a point where you kind of scratched your head and thought, like, maybe I should hang this up and go do something else? And I want you to listen for how Melissa and her co-founder answered that question, because I think it can be a great template for you when you're in your worst moments to reflect on whether it's worth continuing or maybe hanging it up. You're going to hear lots from Melissa. I also loved her description of how she made her marketing dollars stretch further. Uh, She went down to one meal a day, and I'll let her tell you how she got by on that. She has an interesting way of getting beta customers for a new product. She talks about paying uh, or sharing equity with her co-founder and maybe some lessons along the way there. Lots to learn from this remarkably candid interview with Melissa Kwan. Melissa Kwan, welcome to Built Cell Radio. Thanks for having me, John. So you guys solve the cool problem. So my wife and I have bought a few houses in the years. We've been married 20 odd years. So we've you know, bought and sold houses. And I always go to the open houses and they say, here, sign up, you know, and I kind of like, oh, no, I don't want all the marketing crap. <laughs> so I'll like, yeah. I'll like really scribble my name, like signing it like a doctor would, right? Or, or like accidentally in air quotes, mess up my email address with the yeah. view that I don't want to be bothered, right? Yeah. But you guys solved this problem. D- describe Spacio and, and kind of what the what the product does. Yeah, so Spacio is um, you know the industry leading open house app. Um, so as you mentioned, um, you walk into an open house and the first thing you get is an agent telling you to sign it, right? And you know it's no different than like walking into an office building uh, where you have to sign in as well. But like none sure. of those things are legible, right? Or if you see. Um, a real estate project, there's like a welcome car that you have to sign in before you even get a brochure. And everybody just draws like squiggly lines. Um, but that open houses, like agents are not doing that for free, right? They're doing that to capture people who are buying and selling and they're following up with those people. And so they can't follow up with those people if they can't read your writing or if the information is fake. And I remember so, some, at, at some point, I remember seeing this, you'll be able to tell me if it's correct or not. But the chief beneficiary of the open house is not actually the person selling the home, although that there sometimes gets some benefit. It's oftentimes the, this, the, the idea yeah. that the agent often will build a list of people that are interested in Absolutely. buying. And that's almost the magic of open houses. It's less about selling the house and more about yeah. the agent. It's, it's totally a marketing event. 
Um, and, and sellers do um, sometimes sell their home through that, but it's primarily for the agents to get buyer and seller leads and also to farm the area to show neighbors that, you know, this, like I have a home in the area and I have a lot of buyers that are coming in. So if you're thinking about selling your home, you should list with me. So it's really kind of a dog and pony show. Um, it's very, very effective because it's not like filling in a form on Zillow. Like you're meeting somebody face to face and there's nothing really in real estate that's more important than that, especially when it's like the biggest transaction of your life. Um, sure. So Spacio was uh, or is the iPad um, app for people to check into open houses. Um, we actually sold to the enterprise. So we sold to a brokerage and they would give this to their agents as a benefit of, you know, joining that brokerage. So usually agents have like Spacio, they have a CRM, they have some like email marketing as like perks. Um, and so we, what the, what the buyer sees or the seller sees like as they're coming into the home is like a digital sign in. It's beautiful. It's digital. It's easy. Um, you don't have to touch a pen or anything like that. Um, but mainly you had mentioned like, you didn't really want people seeing your contact. That's actually a big problem for people coming in. Like I, if I'm looking at my neighbor's house or, or whatnot, I don't want another neighbor coming in and seeing that I've been here. So that's actually a big reason why people lie about their, um, their contact information and their name. It doesn't mean that they don't want to be followed up with. They just want their privacy. So what happens when you type your contact information and your email into an iPad, it just disappears. It's not just out there for everybody to see. So the sign up rate is actually much higher when it's digital and it's like there's no legibility issues, right? It all goes into a back end, it automatically gets, you know, sent into a CRM. It automatically sends you a follow up. So for the agent, all I have to do is bring this iPad People love it. It makes me look good. Makes me look techy. Yeah. And then people sign in. I get accurate information. An automatic email goes out. We even had like cool features, like we would verify your email. We could pull social profiles. We had like your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook profile, and then we had like a little picture to remind you who they are. And those are just like third-party services that we would link with. So for an agent, that was a really neat tool. Um, but for the brokerage that we actually stole to, um, it was a value add for them to give to their agents, which in that world is like their employees, but you know, their contractors. I love, I love this. It's, you know, why I love it. It's because, you know, I'm constantly telling my kids, like, you don't have to come up with some brilliant idea that's you know never been done. You just have to take something that is already being done and make it a little bit better. Like there were already sign-up sheets. It's not like you invented the sign-up sheet. They just were analog and kludgy and public and wrought for you know uh, abuse and you made it better. So I just I just love this. How yeah, did it's you just come digital up- paper? Yeah, Sorry. I love yeah. it. How did you come up with the idea of selling to brokerages? What was that journey like? How did you land there? Well, I mean, I think most ideas in companies, big or small, are driven by revenue. I mean, at least I hope they are, because that's the only sustainable form of funding. Um, And we were not venture backed. I mean, I've never been venture backed. Um, When we started, like I had pulled out a bank loan at a company before that. So I pulled a loan against that revenue that I had. I put in a lot of my own savings um, to start that company. So every decision that we made was revenue driven. Like we didn't have a choice. So the product, um, you know, I'm, I mean, it's, it's interesting you say like, oh, it, it doesn't have to be that innovative. It can just be something so simple. But while that's true, I think a lot of people listening and ha- that have started companies, it's like hindsight 2020, right? The form that Spacio started making money, like the first product somebody would pay for, it took two and a half years to get to hmm. because we had tried like 10 versions of that. And it wasn't until we removed a whole bunch of features and only focused on the sign in part that people started using it. So I agree with yes, it should be super simple, but the journey doesn't always start like that because you always start thinking, oh, it has to be all this stuff, or otherwise people won't pay for it, especially in technology. But somebody once told me, and this, this always stuck with me is, you know, people think that innovation has to be so bleeding edge, right? But innovation is 
changing the way someone does something forever. And sometimes that improvement is just incremental. And for us, it was paper to digital paper, but it didn't start that way. We had like 20 features surrounding it. And it was very, it was very, a, a very bloated product. And I remember pitching to a VC uh, because we were running out of money. And he was like, well, you know, this seems like it has legs, but there's too much stuff in it. You should just remove everything and focus on the one thing everybody does, which is signing in. And at that point, I'm like, no, it's too simple. Nobody would use it. But prior to that, nobody understood what we were trying to do. Like it was still an open house product, but it just had like so many moving parts. And so he was like, no, just like, just rip everything out and just focus on this. So at that point we had like 60 more days and um, I was like, well, it can't hurt. So 60 more days it. for clarification. What do you mean by 60 more days? Uh, until I run out of money yet again. <laughs> it was just like a constant, you know, vicious cycle of running out of money. Um, and so that was a product we, we relaunched with. And that was for the first time people started understanding it and using it. And I really just went to Craigslist actually, and, and just got a bunch of people to try to use it, to beta test it. And then I would go to those open houses that agreed to use it to see if they would actually do it. And then at, like, and watch them ask me sign in on this thing. And that was actually how, how we started, but how did we go to the enterprise? I think, especially in, in real estate software, um, very few companies achieve direct to consumer, right? Direct to consumer is like direct to agent, like real estate agent. Sure. There's like, like Zillow has done that. That's a direct to agent product. Most companies in the real estate tech world sell to the brokers. They sell to the franchise because you're selling to, you know, a thousand people at once, but instead of like 20, like $20 per person, you're getting maybe $1 a person. So the math is less interesting per user, but each contract is bigger. So you mentioned that you almost ran out of money. Can you estimate how much of your own personal savings and money you borrowed from your other company that you kind of poured into this before you got outside capital? 700,000. Wow. Um, yeah, it was not a good time. <laughs> it was, I was, uh, I mean, I moved to New, I moved to New York from Vancouver to grow this company because New York is, a, is the real estate capital of the world. Every, like, it's the only city where there's a gossip magazine for real estate. Like people view agents as celebrities, like million dollar listing. Like people know agents. Um, I, my first roommate in New York went to projects to look at floor plans and he's a fund manager. Like people are obsessed about space and real estate there. And then any company with that's, you know, meaningful has is headquartered there. The real estate conferences are there, so I moved there to to really be around that community and and grow this company. Um, and I was probably in the worst um, point of my career. I had no money. I would go to startup events for food. I would like time the one meal a day I have at like four or four thirty, so I wouldn't get hungry at night. Like it was just not a good time. Um, and that was probably like a good two years of my, uh, of my life. So almost running out of money is like an understatement for that period of my life that I was in. Now you had a co-founder in Spacio. Um, yeah. I've got Ting Sun as, uh, the name. Tell me about that relationship. How did it come about? How did you guys deal with the, the funding piece of this? Um, well, he didn't deal with the funding piece of it. It was all me. Yeah. Like he's from Vancouver. We had a, a pretty good dynamic. Um, we were co-founders first and friends second, which I think is hugely beneficial because I think a lot of people do it the other way around. Um, and it doesn't always work out that way. Um, and it's because we were always business partners first. We always made decisions based on the business. Um, and there wasn't like a lot of like emotions involved. Um, so from that perspective, it was, it was a good working relationship. Did you get resentful of the fact that you were down to one meal a day and having kicked in three quarters of a million dollars and yet he had equity? Um, in hindsight, I would not do it again. So 
I mean, this is a really interesting, this is how I know you're an entrepreneur <laughs> because you're picking up the nuances of um, things that I've, I don't even think about myself anymore, but um, yeah. So he did not invest any of his personal capital. He has always gotten paid. Um, I did not, I, I did not have a salary for a very long time. I had to borrow money from my parents a couple of times. I applied for some government grants um, that, you know, you eventually have to pay those back. They're not, you know, free. Um, I had to be very creative. I was, I was building the business and trying to bring in all the revenue. Um, I think re resentment is not the right word, right? Because I think, I think a lot of co-founder diversity or like conflict comes with like, I feel like I am contributing more than you. So then now I feel like I'm like short straw. I don't think I ever felt that way. And I, and I was very conscious to not because even though, yes, he always got a salary, but it wasn't like what he could have gotten, you know, somewhere else. So I recognize that. Um, I hated the fact that, you know, I, I couldn't figure out the business um, soon enough in order to, for it to be profitable. I think I was, I was hard on myself as well, but in hindsight, um, I would have, not given away so much equity. Like I would How much did he have? <laughs> um it was a 60 40 split. Um you're 60, he was 40. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Um but I would I would say that like he never had to live through any of the hardships that I did. Um you know and I couldn't even get a credit card. Like I couldn't I, I couldn't get a credit card until my company was sold because my credit was so bad, like no, like, and I had maxed out on every single thing. My parents didn't talk to me for two years. So those are things that like, you really? didn't really know you're getting into. Oh, yeah. They, they were just like, when are you going to get a job? Like, this is just ridiculous. Cause I, I mean, I come from a culture where like you get a job, like you become an accountant or a doctor or, or whatnot. And they, they were like, they gave me an education so I could do that. Not so I could put myself through that. And I think my parents did not think, Oh, she's, not and in their mind, not successful because success is, equates money. I, I never, I never had money, so I wasn't successful. So they never thought, oh, she's not successful because she's actually really serious about this. Like in their mind, they always thought, oh, she's not serious about her life. That's why she won't go get a job. Like because they're not entrepreneurs, they didn't have any empathy or even idea on on like what it really takes to get something off the ground. Like this is not. A restaurant, you know, this is a tech company where you have to piece together hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars at a time to pay a full team, right? It's not like, you know, I want to sell you this cup and then you get money for it and then you're profitable. So they never really understood that. Um, and that and that was really hard. So yeah, I think in in hindsight, like if I knew knew back then what I know today, but there's no way I could have because it, it's my first company, um, I would have given myself more credit. Um, I don't think I gave myself more credit because I always thought, oh, um, it's a tech company. So the CTO is really important, but actually the CTO builds the product and like the CEO builds the business. And I do think that like, there are some dynamics where like, you know, the CTO is, is probably, um, maybe more experience is more of an equal co-founder, um, but in hindsight, like I didn't feel like I had that, I had that relationship. Hi there, it's John Morlow. You're listening to Built to Sell Radio. Today, my guest is the co-founder of Spacio, Melissa Kwan. What was it like to have your parents lose? I don't know what the what the word is, but just not supporting what you were doing and, and, and going through that period. What was that like for you? Well, I think that's, I mean, the first you go through, first you go through this like frustration, right? Cause you're like, why can't you understand me? Like, why can't you just let me do what I want to do? Um, but you know, especially when you're in your twenties, I think you, you want to impress your parents, right? Like I have an older brother who they're very proud of because um, he kind of followed like the path that- What, is he like um, a doctor? 
Um, no, he's like an animator at, at Sony. Uh, okay. and he's but he's got, got a like, job. You know, and he's doing he's the, like, yeah, super doing stable. The right thing. Yeah, yeah, he's doing yeah, the yeah, right yeah. thing. Like he's like not married young. And um, yeah. <laughs> you want to you want to make them proud, right? You want them to talk about you to, the, to their friends, especially if you have a siblings that they're, sure. they're proud of. And you, you don't want to be like the black sheep, especially when you're trying so hard. So I think first is like frustration because you're also kind of immature, you know, like in your mid twenties or late twenties, you're like, you're, you're rebellious, right? Like you don't even have that kind of empathy for them. Um, but as you start to get to talk to your founder friends and people experience the same, sing the same things, you kind of also realize that like the same way you don't need your friends to approve what you do, it's kind of the same way you don't really need your parents to approve what you do. It's frustrating because you want them to be proud of you and you want to maybe one day support them and you want to buy them nice things and show them that, you know, I've made something out of myself and that would be really cool. Um, but if they're not supportive of your journey or, or if anyone's not supportive of your journey, like the, one of the last conversations I had with, with my mom back then before we just stopped talking was like, um, I feel bad about myself every day. Like I already feel like I'm a failure. I know I'm not good enough. I actually can't hear this from you as well. So I think what's best is we just don't talk to each other because I can't have this negative force and I know I can't change your mind. And I, I'm not like suggesting that was the best thing to do, but for me, like there was just no way around it. Like it was adding so much weight onto a situation that was already so difficult. Um, I needed to be away from any sort of like negative energy that would negatively like impact my performance because I need like every bit of spirit <laughs> to like make this go. So I think at first it was definitely frustration on like, why can't you understand me? But eventually you just learn to move yourself away from that emotionally and, and just focus on your business and hope you that know, it works out. Yeah. Well, it certainly did in your case. And I, I'd, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on this because I think there's this, this folklore among entrepreneurs, which is, you know, like you, you, you never quit, you, you keep going. And sort of this very, this mentality of like, no matter what you always have to keep going. And and in your case, I mean, gosh, you had this great enterprise sales career, probably making a lot of money, making your proud. Then you pour 700 grand into this thing. You're eating one meal a day, your credit's shot. Like what, what gave you the confidence to continue to plug away? Like what was like, what were you seeing that made you think, no, no, I'm on the right track. What were the, what were the signs? What were the things you were looking at? I mean, that's, that's a great question. I think back then, um, and it's, it's almost like until you see real success. Um, and I don't mean like million dollar success, right. I mean like a light at the end of the tunnel, like whether that's break even or close to like, um, product market fit, like whatever that is for you. Like until you see that everything feels like it's against you. But what did, what did you see that gave you the confidence? Cause there were a lot of forces that were like, yeah. <laughs> this is not working. Go come up with another yeah, idea. I mean, you must have been seeing some success. I didn't. See, okay. So the, what the, the point I was trying to make with that analogy was nothing. Like everything was against me. We had some customers, but not enough for me to be like, okay, this is it. Like, I think we had like five or six, right? Broke like, and, and yeah. And you know, it could be like, you know, $300 to $500, like not nearly enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it could be early supporters that just want to be different. Um, it's, it's not enough to, for, like, for you to feel like, oh, this is a real company. Like, people are going to buy this. Um, the, the way that Tang and I made decisions, and, and at that point, Tang was pretty tired of this. Right. Like, he was like, okay, it feels like we're kind of beating a dead horse. Should we? Should I go and find another job? Do you want to keep going? Like, and he was always, he was always very supportive of whatever I wanted to do. And, and that actually is a big reason why that co-founder relationship works um, or works. Um, but I had so much invested in this already. And like, 
My uncle had invested a hundred grand that I didn't want to lose, but what was I going to go back to? I'd moved to New York. I can't move back to Vancouver. Like I can't go just go rent a place. I'm in so much debt. Like I had nothing. I had nothing but this, right? I had nothing to go back to, like no fallback. My parents weren't talking to me. I don't, I don't have like a cushion, right? So um, the way that I ended up making decisions was I remember having this conversation with him and said, okay, um, let's talk through this, right? So if we don't keep going, what are you going to do tomorrow? Because the first thing I needed to do was keep my CTO. There's nothing without my CTO. So he was like, well, you know, I would apply for jobs. Okay, well, where would you apply for jobs? How much would you get paid? Okay, so you're telling me that the worst case scenario is better than where you are today. So that's, so he was like, yeah, I guess that's true. So then I asked him, um, if you gave up tomorrow, uh, how would you feel? And that actually became the premise by which we made we made those decisions when, when we felt that way, when we felt like we wanted to give up because it was not based on facts, right? It was not reasonable. In fact, it was fairly unreasonable. And if the answer to that question was, I would still wonder like if there's another door, like I would still wonder if we didn't go as far like as we could. Um, and if, if the answer was, I would still wonder, then we just keep going. And right. luckily for us, like, then we started getting another customer and another customer and another customer. But there were so many points that we could have given up and nobody would have been like, you guys didn't try hard enough. But I don't yeah. agree with this whole narrative of like, you should keep going and you just need to try harder. And, you know, sometimes you need to do something else. Like sometimes you need to fail in order to find something, like give yourself the time to find something else that you can succeed in. Like not all ideas and products are great. Just because you work harder does not mean you're going to succeed. Yeah. Which is why I asked the question and I loved your answer. The, the idea that, you know, at the end of the day, we feel like there were still stones that we hadn't unturned yet. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't have that regret. When your uh, uncle invested a hundred grand, how did you value the company? Was it on a, like, was it, like, how did you guys come up with it, the equity that he would get for the hundred grand that he I just made invested? It I mean, isn't that, isn't that how like everybody makes it up? I mean, he was, yeah, yeah. he was one of the first people. So it was like incorporated and then got a hundred grand from him. And it, back then it was like, I mean, there was some standard, right? Like there, we're, we're not from the Bay area. Right. So it would be like, I think any, anybody in San Francisco would be getting right out of the gate, like. 5 million, you know, on a convertible note. I think we did like three or something like that. Um, but now yeah, sorry, three, what? Three, three million, three million. You got um, a convertible note from your uncle for three million. Sorry. I don't know. I'm not so the valuation that. was like, oh, it was I'm like a hundred grand okay. on 3 million convertible note. Like, um, but now like when you, if you're from the Valley, it would be like eight or not like eight to 10 million, right? Right out of the gate. If you're a second time entrepreneur, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Got but it. you know, yes. it's just, I mean, it was a, it was a favor. Like it wasn't really based on anything. Yeah. So he got roughly 3% if I'm doing the math, right. Is that right? Uh, something like that. 300,000. So roughly 3%. Got it. And, and he did, did you structure that as a convertible note? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. And it was, a, it, it was time-based. Um, there was like a couple other triggers, but it, it just over time converted. Um, and I forgot what the discount was back then, but there was like a bit of a discount. Can you um, just describe in layman's terms what you mean by convertible note? Oh man, let me think. It's it's like it's almost like I need I need to relearn this. Um, it's basically a company. It's it's like a debt structure, right? So like because it's so new, you don't have an actual valuation. You're not selling equity. You're selling. Um, you're selling the opportunity to convert your investment into equity when your company is um, far along enough for uh, what that when you raise an actual equity round for someone else to set that price. Um, but then because you came in early, um, everybody will buy at a certain price. And because you came in early, you get like a discount when that converts. So 
Um, but it also has these mechanisms built in that if you never raise another round, like if nobody ever sets a price, then it converts by itself in three years. I think that's the standard. Um, and then there was like an equation that that happens, but it would be like converting at three years at 3 million, like at yeah. the valuation that you had set. Great explanation. If folks want to learn more about convertible notes, obviously Google's your best friend and, and, and also le- lawyers should be involved if you're going to paper any of this yeah, stuff. Absolutely. But, but it's a, it's a very common way to, to finance a startup be when, as you point out, uh, there is no real valuation yet. Nobody's sort of institutional has come along and say, okay, it's worth X. So it's a great, in very simple, very low paperwork, et cetera. But again, Google it and then talk to a lawyer who knows what they're doing to uh, to paper it properly and keep it all on the up and up. So that's awesome. So that's helpful. You reached a point, and by the way, I should point people to your Medium post and we'll put it in the show notes, built to sell.com. The, the Medium post you wrote is a two-parter, which is a great sort of synopsis of how you built it and, and I think maintained 94% of the equity or something to that effect, but you, you maintained a big chunk of the equity along the way. Folks can, again, get that uh, Medium post. We'll link to it in the show notes. At one point, you mentioned that you reached a point where you were like 90 days or maybe 60 days away from giving up. You, you'd sort of plot it out, your burn rate, you had a little bit of cash left and you said, okay. And, and I think you and Ting sat down and said, okay, you know, we, we need to make a decision here. And I th- this is really the 60 day mark where you were realized that it was, it was now or never. Can you describe what happened next? Yeah. Um, I can't believe you found that medium post. I did write that. I did. I, I wrote that as like a postpartum, like after that, after this company was sold, um, the acquirer wanted me to give like a company presentation, um, about me. And I'm like, what am I going to talk about? I'm not that interesting. Um, and that, that post came from a talk, um, like my 10 slides that I, that I went through when I was thinking about like, okay, how, like, how do I, how did I even like do this? Um, so it's actually a pretty interesting post. Um, So yeah, like I decided to leave no stone unturned um, for that period of time and do everything in my power um, to make this go. And like we were, if we were going to go out, like we were not going to go out without me trying everything under the sun. And that meant like being willing to cold call or do outreach to any potential customer, asking everybody for a referral talking to anybody with money, friends, family, investors, family offices, like any VC that will talk to me, I'm going to go and pitch them. Uh, And I was going to think like, I was going to wake up early and I was going to do this every single day. And I was going to go to every event um, and find a way to get there because I couldn't buy the ticket. So (laughs) I would find a way to get there. Um, And it was actually through that, that we met um, the one investor, like the one kind of outside investor that brought us out of debt, um, at that, at that point, like we had so much debt, we had like accounting debt, we had lawyer debt, like, oh, my lawyer, like $50,000 or something. And these are people that keep our business running. Like, these are not people you can actually not pay. Um, but we had a really big firm and I think they kind of knew what we were doing, but I was kind of reaching the end of the rope with them as well. Um, also my accountants. So um, yeah, so it was actually through that experience and, and doing everything possible that we met the one person um, that actually gave us 250,000, complete stranger. And then because he gave us 250,000, this other company, which uh, was a customer, gave us 100,000 and that, allowed us to hire our first, like our first developer to help Tang because before that it was just like me, him, a designer, um, and then like some contractors here and there, but that allowed us to hire like our first person and then our second person. And then that allowed us to expand our product. Um, and it was actually because there was someone called me, I was at my share, like I was at my shared space, um, or like emailed me and said, Oh, call me. I want to buy your app. Like this person found our app on the app store, like the Apple app store. And I'm like, who's this person? Like, we're not for sale. 
Like this, they, they probably just think we're like some little app on the app store. But because of leaving no stone unturned, I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I have to respond. So then he's like, okay, call me. So I called him and it just happened to be this guy that worked for an insurance company. And I was like, hey, this is a real company. It's not really for sale, but I am looking for, for money. He's like, oh, my boss has money. Maybe you should talk to him. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, and that was what happened. Like, it's not even, it's, it, it, this person's not even an investor. We're the first and only startup he's ever invested in. They were dabbling with the idea of starting a fund. Um, and then it didn't actually happen. We're the only company that they invested in, but that's, that's how did happened. you how did you structure the 250 and the 100 like what was the um it was there? also on uh it was on a safe um which is a version which is a dumbed down version of the convertible note um and then it was for five million um because we, we still didn't have enough traction in order to get like a, a price round like we were still very early right. um and, and when you say on five million you're referring to a valuation of five million yeah yeah got it Hi there, it's John Morlow. You're listening to Built to Sell Radio. Today, my guest is the co-founder of Spacio, Melissa Kwan. And so where does it go from there? You get this injection of money. What next? Did, were you like, how did you go from sort of this very desperate times to being acquirable effectively? Like, what's that journey like? Well, from the fr I mean, the very desperate time was not figuring out a product that somebody would pay for. That was really the hardest, right? Like you're constantly changing your product and changing your pitch and going back to the same customer you thought you were going to sell to and, and telling them, oh, I changed this thing and they're sick of hearing from you, right? Like that's the, that's the desperate time, right? Like by the time we found a product that some people were willing to put their credit card in, I, I remember I was like at some, uh, like a, a breakfast meeting of a brokerage and they were going to give me 10 minutes to talk about this app. Um, I was sitting there playing with my phone and I got like a Stripe notification of someone paying like $15. And I was like, is this a test? And then I like emailed Tang. I was like, is this a test? There's there no Slack or anything. And he was like, what? Somebody paid us? And because um, it wasn't an app back then. It was like the first version was a, it was an iPad optimized website that you like go full screen and it looks like an app. Um, and then, so that was, um, I think that was like September, 2017. So actually from the moment we found the product that someone would pay for to the moment we were acquired was only two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really that long. Um, so even though Spacio felt like an eight year journey, like I really ran the company for five years, but let's say it was an eight year journey. Like finding that product took two and a half years. So tell and me then what once, happened. Be Go ahead. And then once someone started to pay for it, we were iterating, iterating, and then it, the deals got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we were profitable because each deal was like, we had a super small team and because we were always revenue driven and had to be creative. The one good thing about not having venture capital is it forces you to make money you cannot try marketing channels. You can't try cool products. Like your VC doesn't force their portfolio companies to use your product. Like you actually have to create value in the world, right? Like not just give it away for free. Like there's sure. no free trial. Like there's no free, there's a free trial. There's no free version. Like having a free version is a luxury, right? How did you go though from the first Stripe payment to being acquired. I mean, did you invest, invested, you mentioned in technology people, did you invest in more salespeople to, to no. go to more brokerages was, or did you continue to do that piece? Yeah. I was always the only salesperson. Um, real estate is actually like the real estate is a big industry, but there are very few players and, um, it's software sold through conferences, right? A few times a year, all the brokers go like, it's, it's a very, like it's, it's actually a super small industry. It's easy to navigate. You just need to, people just need to know that you're going to stick around because there's so much churn in the industry and it's so hard mm -hmm. to sell into, but it's also very cliquey, right? So like once like one broker starts using it, they're like, well, what's that? So then you, you, you build credibility with every sale. And then you got a fateful email from a guy named Aaron. You want to describe that email? Yeah. So that is actually, so the interesting thing is like, you kind of fake it till you make it, right? 
Um, especially in the real estate industry. Like it's just so small that like people, you need to put yourself on the map somehow. I think somebody wrote about us, about this like, you know, new digital and cool like open house app. And I was going to a conference um, that someone else had to like, had to pay for me for because I had no money. Um, And I had to fly to San Francisco for this conference. And um, he was like, I will get you the hotel room in my, um, with points. This other guy had an extra ticket and he was going to get it for me. And he's like, the only thing you have to do is fly yourself there. Like if you find yourself a way to get there, you will go to this conference. And that was during that period when I was like, leave no stone unturned. Like I have to go to this thing. And then I get an email from Aaron Cardell, um, who was the CEO of HomeSpotter, eventual acquirer of my company. And was like, hey, you know, we're looking for an open house app um, to acquire. Would we'll love to meet you. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like we just have like a one page iPad app. (laughs) Like, why does this guy think I'm anything like bigger than that? But that was um, me and Aaron's first meeting. We became friends after that. Um, But he was like, yeah, we're looking to add something to our stack. I'm like, well, what would you pay for this? And I didn't tell him where we were at. Um, And he was like, oh, I don't know, like maybe 200, 250,000. I'm like, it was not even interesting, right? Like I might as well just go see what happens. But I was just curious to see what he would say. Um, But we became friends because of that meeting. Um, And then he became almost like a mentor because he had been in the industry for much longer. And uh, eventually they acquired our company. So where does it go from there? So you're having this email exchange, you're becoming friendly. You know, how big are you at the point where conversations kind of move from mentorship to, hey, maybe we should acquire, like in terms of how, whatever proxy you want to use for size, like number of brokers using the tool or number of employees um, or whatever. Yeah, we had, I think, over 100,000 agents. So under about, I would say, like a little over 100 brokerages of all sizes, um, anywhere from like the one office brokerage to the largest in, in the largest privately owned in the US, which is H- Howard Hanna. Um, and it wasn't a progressive journey. Like we were friends. Like it was, it was no different than like, like all the founders in real estate is because it's so small. Like all the founders of tech companies that, that stick around, they're, they're, they're just friends. Mm-hmm. And um, because we were friends, he was also someone that I, I respected. Um, he always kept himself. He was very humble. He was never in the media. Like he was very, very pragmatic. He was very smart. And he was like more of an observer. Um, and I would go to him for advice, but I would also go to him to complain because he always had good advice. And, um, I was just so fed up with where I was. Like I wasn't having fun anymore. Help me square that because it sounds like things are going well at this point. Like we got, we got 350 grand from outside investors at a $5 million yeah. valuation. We got a hundred brokerages, a hundred thousand agents. I mean, like outsiders listening to that thinking, man, this is taking off. This is great. So why yeah. are you, what's help me square that. So we were profitable already. Um, I was slowly paying myself a little bit more. I was like starting to pay back my debt. Like every new deal we got, t- you know, Ting and I would pay ourselves a little bit more. So we were kind of like, I was, there was a, definitely a pass, right? Like, and also I was, I left New York to, to nomad. Like I, I lived on the road actually for, for three years um, because I was like, well, if building this company is hard and I get to choose what makes me happy, then I might as well travel and, and do it from anywhere in the world. But you so, mentioned you were frustrated and Aaron was your mentor. You approached him, but so what was frustrating? Why were you done at this point in the journey? I um, don't know if I could say this on this podcast. Hopefully no real estate person is going to listen. I hated my customers. <laughs> Just, mm. I hated my users. It wasn't, um, and, and in hindsight, there were a lot of things that I would have done differently. And I, uh, these are things that I've written about as well. Um, but it also, it became a company that was more of a means to an end. Like it was never going to be, um, you know, a multi-million dollar company. Like it could have been like, maybe a two, $3 million company. Um, I would have been fine running that. Like I, if I didn't sell to someone that I liked, I would have just kept it. Um, I was frustrated with my customer base. Um, I didn't like the support. I didn't like that the company's potential was limited. 
So I felt like I was trying really hard and I wasn't going to get the return that I wanted. Um, also, the multiples in real estate tech is extremely low as we're talking about acquisitions, right? Like, so if you're a company that's not doing very well, um, your multiple would be like one or two. One or two, um, of, if one or two revenue, of gross revenue. revenue. Right. Like a SaaS company, if, you're, if it's pretty good, most companies fall between three to five times. If you're exceptional, which not a lot of companies in real estate have achieved this, it would be like five to seven. Where and would you I think put like, yourself at this stage in, in that range? Yeah. Were you in the first, the second, or the third camp? Um, definitely the second. Like we were fine. Like we were doing well. We had lots of reputable customers. We were not exceptional. Like we didn't, we didn't sell, you know, direct to agents, right? So we didn't really have that potential. But only like a handful of companies have ever achieved over five times. Um, and that's actually, I think, kind of why like a lot of these acquisition prices are not published. Like they're they're not good. It's not good for the industry for <laughs> other companies to, to know this. Um, but I was also seeing like outside of real estate, the multiples that other companies were getting 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. You look at a, you know, you look at Shopify, that's like publicly traded SaaS company, 40 times. That will never happen in real estate. So you're trying so hard to build this company, maybe equal effort as outside of real estate, but you're getting half the multiple or maybe less. So that like understanding that was really discouraging. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. mostly, I think the most important part was I just wasn't happy doing what I was doing. And I was waking up every day, dragging my feet, and I had to pretend to be someone else in front of my co-founder as well. I can't tell my team that I'm unhappy and that I hate this. Like, of course, there's frustrations, but I can't tell them, like, I want to get rid of this thing. Tell me about when the conversation with Aaron goes from sort of mentor, mentee to, hey, Melissa, we want to buy your company. Well, I was just complaining to him one day and I'm like, you know, I'm so tired of this and like, I need to do something else. So like at that point, I'd been in this industry for almost 10 years. And before that I was working in real estate as well. So maybe I'm not even that old, right? So maybe 12 years uh, I had spent in real estate. It's, it's my entire career. And I was just kind of ready to do something else, right? It's like, when I started the company, I was a different person. The only constant in my life, you know, from like starting it to, to that, that point was this company. So right? what was so, his reaction to your, I'm just tired. I wanted to go do something else. What did he say? Yeah. So I actually just said like, I wonder if Tang will like, let me just sell my piece to someone else. Like, I wonder how he would feel about that. And Aaron was like, oh, well, if you're serious, we're actually looking to make our first acquisition. Um, you know, we should talk, but you have to stay in the company. Like, you're, I'm not going to let you like go anywhere, but maybe there's a path for, for you to exit. And the best thing about that conversation was because I'd known Aaron for all these years, I didn't have to hide. I didn't have to pretend to be someone else because if I were to package the company to pitch to other people, I would have to pitch another story, right? I would have to say, this is so exciting. And if you do this and, you know, you would, you could make this into something else and I'm going to stick around because I'm, I love this company. Like that's what you would have to do as a founder. Otherwise they're not going to buy you. They're not, gonna, they're not going to buying a founder that hates their company. Right. So the good thing with Aaron is he knew I would deliver like he knew I was never going to leave my customers and leave Tang. And he knew I was always going to stick around and do the right thing. But he also knew what I was frustrated with. So I where did you go like, from there? Yeah. So I was like, oh, can like at that point, nobody knew anything about home spotter. Like they were, they were never in the spotlight, right? Like nobody even knew what they really did. Like Aaron was there, but he didn't really talk to anybody. So we just signed an NDA. And then he was like, well, let me share some of the things that I'm planning. And then um, that was when I realized, oh, actually, this is a real company with, with significant impact and they have quite a, quite a bit of capital and also access to capital. Um, and it became really, it, it became a possibility. Um, so it wasn't, I was not pitching the company. I didn't, I didn't pitch it to anybody else. Um, we actually didn't even tell other people we were selling. I wasn't trying to get the highest price. 
Um, so how did the comp, how did it go from him kind of almost pitching you on his vision uh, for HomeSpotter to uh, like arriving at what he was willing to pay for Spacio? Did 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 you guys did you throw a number out there? Did he throw a number out there? How did you guys structure um, it? No. So this is, I think, a really special case. Um, so we started the conversation in November 2018, and the company was was sold, closed, like, first week of January. Wow. In, like, so it, it moved really quickly. And there wasn't actually an event we, we wanted to make because there was a big uh, real estate conference that we wanted to announce this in to, like, kick off the year because um, it's very seasonal. Like, in January, everybody does kickoffs. And, like, you kind of put yourself on the map and he wanted to show the industry that home spotter is a real player, like actually bought a company. So, um, I knew because I, because I know Aaron so well, I also knew that he is a super fair guy. Like he is not someone that tries to take advantage of anybody. And like, he's, he's a, like a very typical Midwesterner. Like he's just like a stand-up guy. So I knew whatever he came up with would be a really fair arrangement. And um, and that I knew he would take care of the team. And I he knew that was important for me. Um, and he knew what was important for me was to keep my lifestyle because I was like traveling around and nomading. Like I was never gonna go back to the office. He didn't care about that stuff. And that's the other thing, like he knew who I was. So and what, he kind of knew Tang through the years that I've talked to him about, about him as well. So what so was his offer? offer? What was his offer to you on a multiple of revenue? I know we can't talk about the actual price, but uh, like what kind of multiple of revenue did he offer you? Um, it was definitely in the three to five range. Um, and it was a mix of, um, it was a mix of cash earn out and also equity, which is, which is very common. Um, cash upfront was mostly to pay out our investors because it was either you pay out your investors or they add more people to the cap table. It's not good for anybody, right? Like my investors have been with me for so long. Like they don't want to be a part of this thing. I don't want them to be a part of this thing, especially my uncle. Like I just wanted him to get some return. Um, and so most of the cash upfront went up, like went to pay out the investors. Um, and and then, was that cat? Did was that? Uh, did they get a return on yeah. that cash or did they get basically their money back eff effectively? Yeah. I mean, getting their money back was already very good, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah. But it's, um, we only had three, do we have three? No, we actually, we actually only had two investors. One investor we bought, we bought out very quickly. Um, and then I think my, my uncle basically doubled his money and then, the other person was like, we just gave him a return that was reasonable because he only came in for like, I, I want to say a year and a half. So it, it just, we basically just gave him a return that we thought was fair. And um, he signed up, he signed off on it. Cause it was either that or like, just get your money back. So we did the right, right. thing. Um, we just did help, what we, we help thought me understand was fair. Something. Help me understand something. And this, you know, this maybe, reveals my ignorance about the process. And again, if this gets into stuff you can't talk about, I totally get it. But help me understand your, I wrote down somewhere that your, your uncle kicked in a hundred grand for 3%. So for him to double his money, if we were just thinking strictly about valuing the company, it would have been a $6 million acquisition. From what we've sort of shared, I'm backing in saying that's probably not the price. So like, did, did you just like, how did you guys arrive at, at, a, at a, do you know what I'm asking? Like, how did you arrive at, at a fair sort of amount of money for your uncle or, or was it all very. I can't um, remember the exact math, but it's never as clean cut as that because I wasn't selling equity. Like I, I wasn't, I wasn't selling straight equity. Like it was a convertible right, note. He, just, and I forgot, he carried the debt. Right. It was yeah, just debt nice, that he yeah. carried. Okay. So I don't remember the conversion and I don't actually remember the real numbers. Okay. Um, but he got his money back with some return. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. Um, I think he was fine with it. I think he, I mean, he's an oil and gas guy and he plays the stock market. So for him, it was just like 
still a favor. Like he would, he would have taken that hundred grand and made it like many multiples over like the five years. But um, thank God I didn't lose it. Like that was the most important thing for me was I did not lose that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, but then most of, most of like the money that went to us was like the earnout that we had structured over the two years that we were there. Um, I had negotiated to leave the company six months like prior to my uh, contract being up. Um, and then a lot of that was converted into new equity into the company, but HomeSpotter actually was acquired um, last year. So that was the actual, like that was our actual payout. Got it. With the earn out, what was it tied to? Was it tied to revenue or profit? Um, it was just was the... time. Yeah, it was just tied oh, time. to time. And then there was like a bonus um, based on like sales. Um, but then COVID hit and we were an open house product. So you can imagine, oh, um, nice. how happy I was that that company had sold. Um, yeah, before the pandemic and then we hit the pandemic and that was not so good. I mean, we, the company still grew. We just didn't hit like the sales numbers that we, we had projected. So what proportion of the earn out was tied to just your tenure versus your performance, your, the, the performance of the product? Like All of the earn out was tied to tenure. It was just oh. a bonus that was tied to I sales. see, I see. Okay, got it. And that was why it was fair because a lot of people would tie the earn out to some metric. Um, like Aaron and NSEO had, had worked out like a structure that would make it really compelling for us to stay. Um, and like, set, like, and, and like upsell our existing customers with, with their products. Got it. Got it. So you got this, these, these funds from an earnout that was tied to your tenure in the company, effectively staying employed. And yeah. then you rolled that into equity into, um, home spotter. Uh, yeah. So okay. like not the earnout was just cash. Right. And then like each quarter you would get like a, like an earnout, and then on I top see. you would get your salary. And then um, a portion of that, like of the sale converts to, um, converts to equity. So just to put it in like layman's terms, right? If your company was sold for 3 million, 1 million would go out to, would be cash. A lot of that goes out to pay out your investors. They're like, they're no longer part of the new company. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. Unless the new company is so amazing or is a publicly traded company that they could just sell their stocks. Otherwise, no investor is going to want to follow you to some privately held company without, like, without an end date, sure. right? And the right thing to do is to cash out your investors that, that have stuck with you. Um, and then a million would be like your earnout. So that could be two years. That could be three years. I think the standard is two or three years. Mine was two years. They tried to push it to three. I said no. Um, and then the last million would, would just be like converted directly to equity that you would hold. So then now you're a shareholder in the new company, which um, in theory would also motivate you to work harder for that company as well so that your equity would go up. Got it. Got or it. the value so, of your equity would go up. I know that was a hypothetical example, but would those roughly the proportions of third, a third, a third in each of the buckets? Roughly? I don't remember. Honestly, I, th I think it was, yeah, I think it was heavily, more heavily weighted towards the equity. Okay. Um, which is pretty common as well, because not especially for privately held companies that are not venture backed. Like they were, they had, they had investors, but they were not like venture backed. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty common because they just don't have a lot of cash to spend. Got it. And how was HomeSpotter valued for the purposes of converting your Spatio equity into HomeSpotter equity? Like were they valuing HomeSpotter on a multiple of revenue? Like you, yeah, it was actually a really fair way of doing it. Um, and that's just another indication of how these guys are just super fair. Um, whatever multiple they gave us, they just hmm. made, like they just gave themselves the same multiple. That's cool. And that was and actually did, the, the right way to do it. And how did that then play out when HomeSpotter got acquired? What was the multiple like higher, lower, about the same as what effectively um, I you actually got? don't. I actually don't know what, what multiple they got acquired at. Um, I think it was probably, I, I, if I had to guess, it was probably pretty standard. I don't know the terms of that deal. Um, but what happens is like, because we're shareholders, we go through the exact same process. Um, we sign a bunch of papers. We um, say we agree to the sale. We acknowledge the sale. Um, and then 
when they get paid out, like all the shareholders get paid out kind of on the same day. Got it. Got it. What was that like? Pretty magical. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty magical. Definitely. Um, I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to happen so quickly, but there's a lot of consolidation happening um, in, in real estate as well. Like a lot of these big funds are, are just buying up little companies and competing with much larger companies. So um, yeah, like I knew there was a lot of activity. I didn't know it was going to happen like within the next year and a half, um, but it certainly did. And I'm glad it did because um, it was like closure, you know, it's, it's, it's like, the last thing that I had to, to that industry and I got to move on from it. So can you describe your parents' reaction when you told them you'd sold your company? They don't have a concept of what that means. So that's kind of like the other unfortunate part is like, I feel like I worked all these years and it was like something that I was very proud of and something that I wanted to share, but they have no concept of what that means. So it was like, okay, great. Um, I remember my dad, the question that he asked me was, so exactly how much are you going to have in your bank? Like that was the only thing that he cared about, which was really disappointing. Um, but that was fine. They just didn't, they just didn't know how, like, they, they just didn't know like what effort that really took. Did you tell your dad? I think so. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, probably, um, but I don't think he was very impressed. <laughs> give me his phone number. I'm going to give him a call. Tell him, <laughs> <laughs> tell him what you achieved and the sacrifice you made. I love it. Um, good. Okay. Listen, I, I want to just blast through a couple of quick questions here before we talk about what you're up to now. One of the things I wanted to ask you, I, I know you, you, you were at this game for a while. Would you recommend for others who were in are in a similar spot that you found yourself in, in the grind of it all? Did you rely on any resources, books, uh, YouTube channels, anything that you would would recommend others sort of follow? Yeah, I would definitely recommend um, two books that I recommend to everybody. One um, is the presentation secrets of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs did not write this book. Um, Carmine Gallo did, but he broke down the way Steve Jobs presents um, the structure of that presentation. And it's really a, a psychology, like human psychology to how to guide someone to a close. So I believe that sales is a learned skill. Um, some people are, you know, better, better at it than others, but nonetheless, it is a science and every single one of my pitches, our website, like every talk that I've been to is structured around the exact same thing. Um, and I always get people to a close. <laughs> so <laughs> I would, uh, definitely recommend that. What it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a, a good salesperson, bad salesperson, you can learn something from that. Um, it's also super simple to follow. Um, and then the other one that I would recommend is um, Questions Based Selling uh, by Tom Fries. So it's, um, it's a method of selling through discovery um, and asking questions and then using those things to get people to a close <laughs> and like crafting your sales pitch. So definitely recommend those two. Um, for all the dreamers out there, I would also recommend if you haven't read it yet, um, The Alchemist. Not a business book, but um, a very inspiring story of, uh, of a boy that leaves his home in search of his dreams. And it's something that um, I also think would, would, it's a short read and um, something that I think people can, be in, can get inspiration from. Fantastic. And we'll put those in the show notes, builttosell.com to get those. Tell us about the new company because you didn't ride off into the sunset and sit on a beach somewhere. You've, you've <laughs> so taken unfortunate. <laughs> what you've learned and, and started a new company. So tell us about eWebinar. What, what, what exactly yeah. is eWebinar? It is so unfortunate that I did not ride off in the sunset. You know, it's so funny. Like you sell your company and people are like, are you retired now? And like, you're just like living your best life. Yeah. I, I wish that were true. 
Um, yeah, so eWebinar uh, is a company I wish existed when I was growing Spacio. Um, so Scratching e your own itch. Yeah, actually, um, I also wrote about, I, I, I wrote a big um, LinkedIn post, I don't know if you saw, about designing your life, um, designing the life you want to lead, not around the next demo. So eWebinar actually is a product that automates webinars by using a video. So what we do is we turn any video uh, into an automated webinar that you can set on a recurring schedule. So you can run as many webinars as you want without actually being there. So, so cool. think about all of your sales demos, your onboardings, your training, your feature updates, your lead gen content, customer interviews, uh, product training for staff, you know, whatever it might be, any pitch that you need to do over and over again, and you are sick of doing them, we are the product to help you never do those again. How do you <laughs> make it feel for the, for the person watching the webinar that it's, it's sort of live and dynamic? How do, how do you, what are your tips and tricks for making it appear like a webinar as opposed to just a video? Yeah, so um, I think it's the experience of like signing up for a webinar, right? So a video is you go to YouTube and you hit play. You go to, uh, you know, Netflix and you hit play. Sure. But then you could also hit pause, right? And then you can leave and then you never get back to it. A webinar has a registration process, right? You pick a time, you get a calendar invite, you get reminders. And then after you get follow-ups, it starts at a certain time. But the most important thing is within a webinar, you get to interact with the host. So you get to ask questions, you get to text them, you get to answer a poll. So all of those like little nuances are built in. Um, the chat is there, but the uh, like, but you can respond in real time if you want to. But if not, they'll get your response on email. It's no different than like when you land on a website, you get a little chat bubble that says, "Can I help you?" It's the exact same flow. Um, so what it does is people register for a webinar. It can start right now if they want to, but if they're heading out the door, they can choose a session that's happening tomorrow at 2 p.m. They go to their computer because they're actually free. Um, and they get to chat with you. And if I happen to be there, I can hop in and respond. Um, oh, cool. If not, yeah, if not, if not you, hit, you respond past, uh, after the fact with email. So cool. Yeah. Uh, the website, eWebinar, tell us the website. You ewebinar.com. We totally lucked out on the URL. It's exactly as it sounds. Awesome. Ewebinar.com. Ewebinar.com. We'll put all that in the show notes. Yeah. It's, for, it's for people who hate running webinars. We can do them for you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, that's great. I, uh, I appreciate you sharing your story. It's amazing. I, give me your dad's phone number. I'm going to give him a quick ring right now and uh, tell him about sacrifice. It was great to meet you and thank you for doing this. Thanks so much, John. Appreciate it. Hey, listen, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Melissa Kwan. I've got a favor to ask. If you know someone like Melissa, who has a great built to sell story, please get in touch, nominate them to be a guest on the show by going to built to sell.com slash nominate built to sell radio is produced by Haley Parkhill. Our audio and video engineer is Dennis Labataglia. If you like what you've just heard, subscribe to get a new episode delivered to your inbox each week. Just go to built to sell.com. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. -L 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 Thanks for listening.